It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Try Haven Brand Soil Conditioners providing generations of gardeners with a truly all-natural alternative to chemical fertilizers with their line of composted manure and alfalfa teas. Easy to brew and use on all indoor and outdoor plants. Find them online at manuretea.com. Hello, friends. Today, I have the pleasure of chatting with Ashley Sassoon, the owner and lead designer of Wildwood Floral Company. Now, Ashley and I met a few years ago when I was president of the Indianapolis Rose Society, and she joined our group. Unfortunately, she and her husband were only in our area temporarily, but I'm grateful for the friendship we forged, and I'm so glad she's with us today. Hey, Ashley, welcome to Rose Chat. Hi, thank you for having me. So wonderful just to hear your voice. It's been a while. It's been a really long time. (laughs) It has. Well, Ashley, let's start with your telling us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in gardening. Sure. So um, I grew up in Northern California. Um, uh, Let's see. So my mom is my biggest gardening inspiration. So my dad likes to say that she moves plants like furniture. Um, so she does a lot of rearranging in our garden. We have a beautiful park-like backyard garden space um, that I gr- was lucky to grow up with with my brothers. Um, and she just was constantly gardening. And in Northern California, they my mom usually starts gardening in February, actually, which <laughs> when we hit February, I always think about gardening and my mom and we're in Denver right now. So <laughs> wait a few months until we get there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so puttering around in the garden barefoot and I would, I would love to helping her and she, um, did, you know, bigger landscaping things, but she also loved, um, working with container pots and arranging those. And from there, I learned a lot about, you know, things like height in the back, lower things in the front, working with colors together, textures together, that kind of really fun thing, which I'm sure really helps with my work. Um, And we also share, there's a little side area of our garden that we've nicknamed the secret garden um, after one of my favorite childhood movies from the 90s of the same title. Um, And that was basically a little rock garden area that we planted together. And I had a lot of input about what went in there, which was very exciting for me. (laughs) And one of my favorite things was this beautiful morning glory that we had that would grow up over the archway that led into the garden area. And it was the kind of morning glory that would be this vibrant blue in the morning and then fail to, sorry, not fail, (laughs) fade to pale lavender in the evening. It's so beautiful. And I still think about that all the time. So she's a huge influence on my gardening. Oh, I'm sure she is so pleased to hear that. I know I would be so pleased to hear that from my children and and they do love our garden still and have their owns too. Um, So, okay, this gave you the perfect foundation for using all that you love in starting your business, Wildwood Floral Company. So I can tell you, I used to be a florist and Wildwood Floral is not a typical florist. So tell us all about it. (laughs) Well, so um, not typical, and I would say mostly design style. Is that what you would say too, Teresa? Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, there's lots of different design styles in the flower world. Um, the most common one is one where you have um, a lot of flowers that are kind of tighter together to provide this big impact visually. Um, and since... Um, I think 2008, 2010, somewhere around there, some florists in our country started this movement of really taking inspiration from the natural world in making creations with arrangements. So basically we use, so for example, if I was using a stem of ranunculus that kind of curves a certain way, I wouldn't force it into a certain shape in an arrangement. I would use that line. Um, as kind of an interesting visual line and helping to create an arrangement that looks very natural, something that looks like it almost grew out of the vase. Um, And that's kind of what I would say our style is. 
I'm looking at a picture of one of your arrangements and, oh, it's just, you know, it just does look like it's growing out of her hand, actually. You're so right. So can you tell us a little bit about the flowers that you like to use to create these um, beautiful pieces? Yeah. So I use, I like to use uh, a number of different things. So I'm looking at using some focal blooms. So those tend to be bigger flowers. So roses or um uh, Dahlias are a great one for us here because we can also get those locally. Um, some focal flowers mixed in with some secondary blooms, so maybe spray roses, something that's a little bit smaller than your focal. And then we add in texture, so grasses or foliage. Um, and I'm a big fan of not just using green foliage um, or even not using foliage at all. I think foliage is beautiful, but it's been used as a crutch in some, in, in my view in a lot of ways is kind of a filler um, and for me it's just it's not as fun if you don't need the foliage you just can let the flowers shine um, or you can use colored foliage like I'm growing this beautiful Diablo nine bark which is this deep purple color uh, which is really fun because it's an unexpected element and if that's part of the color palette that's a great way to add some beautiful color and texture without having to have some greenery in there if the couple doesn't specifically love green in particular. And then I also love to use little wispy bits. Um, they just add a little bit of you know, whimsy and romance and a little more natural elements to the space. So like bunny tails or scabiosa, um, just little wispy bits that you can have floating over the top of your arrangement. It was a perfect final touch for us. It sounds like you might do a bit of foraging, not just in um, things that you can purchase or grow yourself, but that you might do a little foraging. I do a little bit. So um, I'm going to say, unfortunately, and hopefully I don't get a hand slap for that. But <laughs> unfortunately, we can't forage in most places in the States. So I know other places, Teresa and I were talking about how it's a little bit different in England, but here you can't just forage in a, you can't pick a park or um, you're not even supposed to forage on the side of a highway, um, that kind of thing. Those are big no-nos and you can get fines for that. Um, that said, um, so it's, I mean, it's really good to know the rules. So that said, I do have some, so since we moved here in 2018 to Denver, um, it's basically the same USDA hardiness zone as Indianapolis when we were there, but it's very different because we're much, much higher in elevation. We're the mile high city. Um, so the sun's a lot stronger and it's very, very, very dry. So even though we're the same hardiness zone, you get a lot of different kinds of plants growing and thriving here. So um, one of the things that is just so happy here, which is amazing, is lilac. So every May, we have this beautiful wild lilac that just grows in the alleys. <laughs> oh. And it's the most beautiful thing. I've never seen anything like that wherever I've lived. Wow. So it's amazing and it smells amazing. So um, I've, I, I do have a pair of pruning shears that I keep in my glove compartment box <laughs> of my car. Just in case. Just in case. Um, but usually I use them around the neighborhood and I go knock on my neighbor's doors and I'm not taking anything from their yard. It's just their alley, basically, and which sounds kind of silly, but with our rules and when you have such beautiful flowers growing there, why would you spend, I mean, so a five stem bunch of lilac for me in May, if I bought it for my wholesaler, would probably cost around $35. Um, that's pre-COVID, by the way, so it's probably a lot more expensive <laughs> Um, for just five stems and then that's you're just introducing all of this pollution into the air from you know planes that are flying from you know europe to fly this <laughs> the dutch <laughs> lilac over to yeah. me so <laughs> it yeah. just doesn't really make sense so um so i'll use that i also have a note on my phone that i keep like oh these are really pretty black berries growing on this tree that drapes over this sidewalk you know, three houses down from me. And so, and that's in September. So maybe if I could use something like this next year, I'll go knock on the neighbor's door and people are always really nice. And of course I never take enough to do any harm to the plant or anything. And often you can't even notice what I've taken, but um, so that's kind of what foraging looks like in the States for the most part. 
Um, it's very much here and we want to be very protective of, of everyone's of property. And I, I remember when we bought uh, this place, our, um, we almost have an acre and started planting right off, you know, 35 years ago, everything. But I always had in the back of my mind, could I use this in an arrangement? Could I bring this inside? Yes. Our family is huge on natural decor. We have bags of pine cones, dried flowers, sticks, rocks. I mean, I go to my children's homes and there's a rock over there and there's a bag of sticks or there's a vase full of cool, you know, <laughs> dried something that they've gotten from their yard. And so and so we, we're now hearing a lot about eating in season. And I think um, we can say the same about decor in season. You mentioned the berries and there's the crab apples. And so there's lots of things we can do to plant around us <clears throat> excuse me, plant around us that will be um, beauty, beautiful to bring in in its time. Absolutely. Yep. And we, um, knowing that we weren't going to stay here in Denver for a very extended period of time, we did do some planting, but I only planted things that I knew I could use in arrangements so that were good cut flowers or foliage and that kind of thing. So well, well, you're doing just beautiful work. And I'm wondering, um, we'd like to know, what are the trending colors you're seeing in wedding work right now? Yeah, so that's a really fun one to talk about. Obviously, for me, designing is so much a huge element of what I get to do, which is amazing. Um, so we're currently moving away from a huge trend in greenery. <clears throat> so there's been a, a lot of just greens with whites for uh, quite a few years. So we're moving away from that. And I think people are a little starved for color. Maybe COVID has something to do with that. <laughs> but um, so we're seeing a lot more vibrant colors. So for example, you'll see, um, I just did a beautiful proposal with peach and this dusty rose with some dark raspberry and some cream in there. It was just so natural and beautiful. So we still see, um, so though it's vibrant, we still tend to see for weddings and events a lot of, well, I actually can't speak to events. Let's just say weddings. Um, a lot of colors that are close to one another on the color wheel. Mm -hmm. So that one I yeah. just gave. Um, and then you do see greens and whites and blues are still really popular. Um, and then something that's pretty new are it's kind of taking that even to more of an extreme so instead of having four or five colors that you're working with to create this very natural look and almost ombre feel with your florals um, people are choosing two colors or maybe three mm -hmm. so if you do two you just get much more of a punch of color in there so um, I'm actually doing a, a Galentine's Day arrangement that I'll be filming today and then posting on my website or sorry, not my website on Instagram. Um, that will be up by the time this podcast goes up and it'll be lavenders with some Ruby reds. So, oh. and I'm not putting any greenery in there because greenery, again, it's beautiful, but for my purpose of this arrangement, it just doesn't make sense. I want the vibrant colors of just kind of those juxtaposed colors. So that's another thing that's really pretty. And I will say, um, just because this is part of the trend, which is interesting. And I'm not exactly sure how I feel about it. But um, if you want to do that kind of color blocking with just vibrant colors with no foliage, it's very expensive because greenery <laughs> is less expensive than flowers. And if you're just using flowers, then it's it just drives up the price a whole lot. So what people have been doing is taking foliage that is naturally that color. So for example, that nine bark it's purple. So that would have worked for this arrangement, except it's not blooming right now. <laughs> so um, what people are doing is they're taking other foliage or um, baby's breath and spray painting it to be the color that they want. So it sounds a little odd, but if you see these arrangements where they're just beautiful clouds of color, it just, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how I feel about it, but I think I, I, I appreciate the attempt in keeping things so attainable for people who don't have millions of dollars to spend on just using flowers. I totally agree. And I love um, that people are finding <clears throat> their way out of COVID and they want 
you know, they want it, the more exciting colors and they want vibrancy. I, a lot of the um, gardeners that I follow on social media, they're saying the exact same thing, oh. Ashley. They're saying we're planting all the color. And I tend to be more peachy, pinky, white in my garden, but I'm kind of getting a little restless all of a sudden because there's so many now saying, we're out, we're getting, we're going outside and we're going, we want all the color. Yes. So I'm hearing it too, just from the garden side of things. Oh, that's so interesting. I love that. Mm-hmm. Now um, it's Rose Chad. So let's just talk about some of your favorite roses, whether you use them in design work or not. What are your favorite roses? Yeah, absolutely. So my favorite in the garden that I don't necessarily design with are Lady of Shalott and Golden Celebration. I love the vibrant colors, the Lady of Shalott just almost looks like it's glowing with this color. It's beautiful, and the shapes of those roses are wonderful. Um, however, they're not the best for arranging with. So if you know Golden Celebration, you know the heads tend to nod, so they don't stand up. They're just heavy on the stems, so they're not great for arranging with. Lady of Shalott, I've had when I cut them, they're beautiful, but then I also have the petals closing during parts of the day and then opening during parts of the day and it's just not a really reliable cut flower for wedding work per se um so that said um some roses that i love to design with um, one of my absolute favorites is litchfield angel because it's uh relatively thorn free um and Teresa, you can correct me if i'm wrong that's what mine is (laughs) (laughs) um But it's just this beautiful, it's a white, but it's not a crisp white. It's more of a creamy white, and it has a beautiful shape to it, and it holds up really well. Another white that I love is Iceberg. It's very reliable. Um, Another one that I love is Munstead Wood. You're kind of seeing a theme here with Mm -hmm. Tate Frosted Roses. Yes. Um, But I love the, the burgundy color that's been a big color, popular color in the wedding world that we're moving away from we had blush and burgundy was a very 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 popular color palette for many years but um, we're moving away from that but I do appreciate using burgundies in fall palettes too and then of course the Munstead wood has such a beautiful scent Um, and then I do want to point out some more unusually colored roses that are really big for designing with in the wedding world right now everybody wants them um you can't buy them commercially for the most part. You have to grow them or buy them from specialty rose farms. Um, so there's Distant Drums, which has this beautiful uh, pink, orange, fades to peach and blush color. Um, it holds up really well. Beautiful dark green foliage. It's just a really good kind of chameleon flower. It just goes with a lot of different palettes and there's also coco loco which is a lavender with almost a fawn color to it Um, those are two extremely popular roses right now in the wedding world and then i also really love julia's rose which is not to be confused with the julia child rose which is yellow the julia's rose is a dusty peach fawn color which again it's just one of those chameleon colors it's just very gentle and can be used in a lot of different palettes those are my favorites. Distant Drums is absolutely, I've never grown it. I've almost bought it a million times. And for some reason, it either wasn't available yes. or someone beat me to it. But it is absolutely, people, talk, you know, lots of people talk about this rose and it just photographs beautifully. Yes. It's beautiful. really something. And um, I had Coco Loco and uh, it was beautiful, but there was one of our hard winners and she was not happy. And, and so, um, so I didn't get to keep that one for very long. Let's see, we're looking at your designs and they're just so dreamy. And, and as our uh, listeners start following you on Instagram, if they're not already, they're, they're going to be so inspired and see these dream, dreamy, um, um, works of art that you create. So we all might not be able to do that, but give us a few tips on what we can do at home to um, create our own creations. 
Absolutely. So I just did a class on this last fall at the DRS, the Denver Rose Society. Um, so I would go maybe even rewind and go back to just in case you missed the beginning part of kind of the elements that I look for in building an arrangement, because that will help you a lot um, to create um, the kind of arrangements that I love to do. Now that said, because it's it's very, you're taking inspiration from nature. So there's really not a wrong way to do it. Um, if you want to kind of see if you can mimic the masters, as they say, um, one thing that we do in a lot of one area that our, um, this natural style of arranging has come from is studying still lifes from the Dutch masters. So you'll see a lot of, you'll see a poppy that's just growing on this beautifully curving stem that's placed beautifully in this arrangement. Um, you'll see the colors they use for inspiration, but um, just a good general guideline to get started and then kind of go off on your own, take your own artistic license is choosing a focal flower, choosing a secondary bloom, some um, filler as they call it, which can be foliage, but it can also be other things. I've used um, limonium or hellebore as filler before, um, and then some wispy bits, as I like to call them are all really good elements to use. And if you really want to go the extra mile and you're creating a beautiful tablescape for friends, as we can hopefully do soon, um, the Dutch masters, if you go look at their paintings, they also like to include uh, food. So they'll style food into their designs. So for example, one of our rehearsal dinners we did last year, we had this beautiful floral arrangement that had Coco Loco roses and this beautiful dark green kind of with a purple shimmer foliage um, and cucara blooms that were purple um, in an arrangement. And then we did candles that were the color of Coco Loco to complement that. And then mm. we also did low bowls of figs that were cut in half. So you had the beautiful outside of the fig is the purple to mimic the arrangement and the inside with the pinks that mimic the, loco, the Coco Loco. And so just if you want to get a little crazy with it because you're a little stir crazy at home, you can do pomegranates. Those are really fun to throw into table designs as well. So just go for it. There's really no wrong answer, but those are some good starting points, I would say. Those are excellent starting points. And one of the things I really appreciate is that you sent us to a picture, the Dutch masters. Um, I often say to people when they say, well, what about creating a garden? I always tell them to look for pictures. You know, we're, we're way beyond having to read invent the wheel yes. you know go find there's people there's pictures everywhere now there was a day when there wasn't but instagram facebook pinterest find what you like and then you know just take your time to create what you love so i love that you're sending them to something to look at so there's yes that's just in the i think that's very very helpful good now um you're a former uh, rising star of the American Rose Society, and rightly so. Um, so let's talk just a little bit about your involvement in local and national Rose Societies. Absolutely. So I started with you in Indy, um, <laughs> and I was kind of just dipping my toes and starting my business, So, I'm, and I was also teaching full-time. So I unfortunately didn't have as much time as I would have loved to at the start to get super involved. Um, I did enter a um, photography category at the Indy Rose Society show one year, and I won that, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really fun. Um, and then we moved to Denver, and actually the very first social thing I did when moving to Denver was uh, go to the Denver Rose Society's monthly meeting. <laughs> we had go girl. Moved the week before and I was like, I need to know how to grow my roses here because we, we actually had a digging party and we had friends help us. My husband called it the dig and swig. So we dug up <laughs> our, I think we had about 18 roses that our friends helped us dig up and we potted and we put in the moving truck to come to Denver with us. Oh, I love this so much. Yeah. love this so much. So we got to Denver and I had to know how to take care of these roses in a completely different um, environment. So um, so that, that's how I got started with the Denver Rose Society. And they were so warm and welcoming. Um, Pre-COVID, I got to do things like volunteering at events like their rose pruning workshop and selling roses at the Denver Botanic Gardens plant sale, that kind of thing. 
Um, and a year ago, I was invited to, to join the board of directors for the Denver Rose Society. So um, I was just started serving my second year with them. And um, now what I, I've been doing more of is helping with posts for social media, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I also redesigned and updated the formatting. So basically just the visual for, because that's kind of who I am. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, you are. Yeah, for how our, our monthly email to members goes out too. Um, and then last fall, with the approval of the board, I created a survey to send out to members to help us determine what topics they most wanted to hear during our meetings this year. So we use that information that we got in order to create our programming for this year. Because um, we've been, that's always one of our goals is to make sure we're keeping up and increasing member engagement. So we figured that was a really good way to make sure we're not just creating programs, but stuff that our members really want to hear. So, and also last fall, um, the new programming lead, Michael Wood and I have been working to prioritize making our monthly meetings hybrid. Um, So during COVID, we had virtual meetings, which is wonderful. So, but now we're starting to have meetings in person. Um, But we also have a lot of members who don't live super close to the Denver Botanic Gardens where we meet, or there's inclement weather, which can happen pretty much through May. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So um, we've been working to make sure that we can hybridize our meetings so people can attend virtually or in person. And we just had our run through last week with that, with a lot of our board members to try it out. And we'll have our first hybrid meeting in March. And we're very excited about that. So that's pretty much what I've been up to lately with them. Well, thank you for all the enthusiasm that you're um, infusing in Denver. My goodness, this is fantastic. We too have been meeting, um, uh, virtually in Zoom, and we are just getting our um, ducks in a row so that we can do hybrid meetings, hopefully in March, we're hoping in March, um, to do the hybrid meetings. And um, one of the things that I've noticed, and perhaps you have too, is um, during the COVID thing, a lot of barriers have been broken down, um, and and gardeners in general are are getting together, and I love that. Last night, um, we had... um, Bill Kosmichek talk on climbing roses. And we had, you know, I think nearly 80 people on the call. Wow. And we would not be able for those people to, oh. to be with us normally. And you get you would be beginning to see new names and new faces. And um, and it isn't as good as face to face, but it is a way to connect with people. And there were master gardeners and there were, you know, uh, garden club friends and that sort of thing, all there together, you know under a common umbrella. And I just love that. I love that, you know, more people can participate. So the hybrid is something I think going forward that is, you know, an open door to so many. And even to some of our um, members of our older community, you know, they love, you know, if it's in an evening, maybe they can just hop on Zoom instead of getting out at night and that kind of thing. So, so it works in lots of ways. And it's, you know, one of the positive things I think that's come out of COVID. And I'm grateful for that. We've also noticed that, well, so I shouldn't say we, I've also noticed that there's, um, at least in our society, there's not a ton of people in their 30s, maybe, in the group. And I'm realizing that a lot of us have families. So I am I have a toddler. I, he turned two yesterday, mm-hmm. February 8th. And Aww. so it's just, it's interesting to think about having access to virtual meetings means that I can go to more of them because my husband's in medical residency. So I can't just (laughs) go to a meeting that starts at seven that's out of the house. Um, So this, uh, depending on his schedule. So it's, I think, like you said, it's really the way to go moving forward to get more members engaged and more people in our community around us. And, you know, and it really is, I know in our society, it's not about being an expert at all. You know, we have people who are coming and they're just getting used to roses. And we have people who have one or two in a container. And then we also have people who have 400. So it's just a great melting pot of information. I agree. So, well, Ashley, you inspire me on a regular basis through this, these Instagram posts. So friends, you can find her at Wildwood Floral, Wildwood underscore floral underscore co. 
If you want to know more, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to know more about the American Rose Society or a local society near you, go to rose.org. Ashley, what a pleasure this has been today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's so good to hear your voice. Well, I feel I'm a little picky when it comes to design, but your work completely <laughs> blows me away. Thank so you. thank you for all the love that you share. Thank you. Well, friends, until next time, happy gardening and happy creating from your friends at Rose Chat. You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleve and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.